Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kim Porter. I'm the executive director of Be a Part of the Conversation. I'm so happy to welcome you all here tonight. Our website has more than 100 pages of content on it. There are so many resources here. I hope you'll check them out. Um, of, of the 120 or 30 pages, only one has a person's name attached to it, and that's this guy. It's called uh, conversation.them slash Macaulay. So you'll find uh, recordings of past programs. You'll find resources of his. The two films that Dr. Macaulay made, I'm gonna tell you about in a moment, um, can be found, links to those, and he's so generous that he allows them to be shown on Vimeo. So you can find those links on that page. Dr. Kevin McCauley is a senior fellow at the Meadows Behavioral Health Care in Wick Wickenburg, Arizona. A 1992 graduate of Drexel University School of Medicine, he first became interested in the treatment of substance use disorders while serving as a naval flight surgeon where he observed the U.S. Navy's policy of treating addiction as a safety, not a moral issue, and returning treated pilots to fight to, to, fight to flight status under careful monitoring. After developing his own addiction to prescription opioids, however, Dr. McCauley was court-martialed and imprisoned at Fort Luckenworth in Kansas. There, he read voraciously of what was known about the disease of addiction at that time. Today, he has more than 15 years of continuous sobriety and has worked in, in a non-clinical capacity at several treatment centers, giving more than 2,000 lectures on the neuroscience of addiction and recovery management. From 2004 to 2008, Dr. McCauley was director of Level 3 Recovery Residence in Utah and Sandy, Utah, and the first president of the Utah Association for Recovery Residences. Dr. McCauley wrote and directed two films, Pleasure Unwoven, about the neuroscience of addiction, which won the 2010 Michael Q. Ford Award for Journalism from the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers, and Memo to Self, about the concepts of recovery management. Dr. McCauley currently lives with his wife, Christine, in Sedona, Arizona, and re recently received his master's in public health from the University of Arizona. And thankfully, he has family here in Pennsylvania, so he comes to see us. So please help me welcome Dr. This is, I think, the fifth time yes. we've worked together, and I love working with you. And of course, I love coming to southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, this is where I was born. This is where my, my family's from. My family is here tonight. For us. I have to do a good job. I'm trying very hard not to say anything stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ongoing project when you're in recovery. You seem to have this blindness as to what we actually look like in the eyes of other people. So it's one of the risks of being a person in recovery, and I think that's what what the steps are for is to kind of as we suddenly as we as we become more and more sober as the years tick by and we realize what we did and what we said we need some kind of engine to clear out that mortification shame whatever you want to call it and that's why i think uh, working on program is important so i'm going to try not to do that tonight i was just in aspen last week and the guy who came after me absolutely face planted uh and everyone went, <laughs> Not good. Um, anyhow, um, I kind of use uh, uh, the lectures here for uh, be a part of the conversation as my sort of uh, uh, as my kind of measure for the last year or two, and so I kind of roll new things out uh, for you. Um, just because this is kind of a, a special lecture. Uh, so I've got a whole bunch of slides in here, and then I tried to answer some of the questions that you had asked, so it might be a little disjointed. Um, but uh, if you would like uh, to ask any questions afterwards, uh, I'll say question to the end tonight, but if something comes up, um, please feel free to email me. This is my email. I'm a pretty easy person to get in touch with. Uh, and if uh, you would like to uh, have access to those two films that I made, I'm not a filmmaker, I really can't claim to know what I'm doing when I say I made film. But uh, it really frustrated me that there wasn't a, just a one hour summary of the neuroscience of addiction. Uh, so I went ahead and made one back in 2010. We distributed 70,000 hard DVD copies of that thing and had almost twice that in, in downloads. Uh, but don't buy anything. Uh, please just email me and I'll send you the link to the streaming version that I keep on Vimeo. This is one, this one's about the problem, what goes wrong in the brain. This is more about the solution, which is more interesting, uh, which is you know, how do people kind of stay, uh, get into long-term uh, recovery. Um, but uh, I think I'll just kind of dive in here and do something easy. 
I just made the slide up a couple of days ago. December is an important month for the Centers for Disease Control, the National Center for Healthcare Statistics, because it takes the CDC and the NHCS a year to get all of the death reports from the previous year for people who have died from overdoses. It takes a long time because the number that they release has to be the number uh, that uh, that is going to be long term. So most of us have probably memorized the number from 2021, which is 106,699. That's how many people died in that year alone, and the vast majority of those folks were opioid related. So when the numbers come out in a few weeks, uh, that's going to be you know the number that we should memorize there. As you can see, uh, 2018 actually was a reasonably good year. We went down by about two percent but then we lost that and then the pandemic which is just a massive increase you very very rarely see uh, increases in mortality rate to that degree uh, in public health but it was it was very very sobering um, I would like to redo pleasure on woven uh, I have some friends who are trying to find the money for it um, they live in uh, New Orleans and I believe in putting films in a place. I like to situate films uh, just because it gives the film some personality. And so I'm going to use Louisiana uh, if we manage to get this money. And I would like to open it at uh, LSU, at Tiger Stadium. Because uh, you can imagine on game day at LSU, it's just lots of visual candy to film. Uh, you film all the people. And it just so happens that the, that the, uh, that the capacity uh, for Tiger Stadium one hundred six thousand people. Wow! It's a way of kind of reifying just you know, wow. what we've lost. You know, all those people who don't graduate, children, grandchildren not held, uh, you know, marriages don't happen. Uh, it's really hard to grasp. I think just the degree of loss, uh, because you know, in public health we look at death tables. And, when you get to be my age, 58, you really notice the heart mortality rate starting to climb. If I die tomorrow, that's very sad, but that's kind of what we're doing <laughs> when we get to about uh, you know, our late 50s. We start to die, but not a 20-year-old. When a 20-year-old dies, it's a big hit, and we are talking about millions upon millions of years of life loss. And uh, you know, what I'd like to do is just film on game day, and then you can dissolve to the stadium empty with the narrator on the 50 yard line and just look at entire sections of people moving in and out of risk periods of their life. In and out of when an exposure to this or that is either not that bad or very, very serious. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, we'll be able to have that. Uh, I can't understand why people don't make better films than I make, but I don't know what's going on. But anyhow, if you want to know the the numbers that the government has right now, you can go to the National Center for Healthcare Statistics and look at this uh, uh, page. I put the um, uh, uh, URL down there. You have to use Google Chrome for some reason. It doesn't work in uh, Safari and Firefox. But basically, you look at the numbers for the previous 12 months. And so this is the number ending in December, de December 2022 for the previous 12 months. And as you can see, it's an increase. Not a big increase, but this is not stopping. No one is really entirely sure where this is going to end. It may not these numbers may, in fact, now be end We might be able to get them down by a couple tens of thousands, but that's what we get now. Um, if you were to go back 10, 15 years, it was like 40,000, 50,000. Now we seem to have a, a continuous problem. Uh, so we'll have to see what that number is. But if it's 109,357, that would represent a 2.3% increase, which is much better than this but not good, and 300 deaths per day. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's sobering uh, to see just you know, what is being lost and as we come out of the drug war, or at least that's what people say we're doing. Uh, I hope I can impress upon you what it means to watch drug laws that destroyed entire communities in the United States be turned around when there are still people in prison who have decades more to do on their federal sentence. 
It's a slap in the face. Yeah. And uh, quite frankly, I, I uh, for reasons I will show you, I'm not a drug warrior. In fact, whatever the opposite of a drug warrior is, I think my credentials are excellent. Uh, but it, it's really painful uh, when people put the cart before the horse. And I think for the drug war to end, we would need to go and get those people and bring them back to their communities and make those communities whole. And then we can legalize whatever the f*** we want. Yeah. <laughs> First, that damage has to be prepared. Repaired. There can be no justice uh, without repair. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of look at the drug core ending uh, and just understand what the uninsult that statement is to mm -hmm. people who are still uh, living through this. Um, I generally, when I do the lectures at the treatment center, and I, I basically do this lecture about 14, 15 times a month. Um, my wife says that I've got the most boring job in the world. It, it, it sounds like it, mm -hmm. but every group is different. <laughs> and every group uh, absorbs the material in a slightly different way. And the order in which it's laid out, and the questions that are answered, sometimes I don't think people really even know what they heard, but they got a chance to ask questions. They got a chance to interrogate the neuroscience of addiction, and I think that that can be therapeutic. I am not an addiction medicine expert. An addiction medicine specialist or expert is a doctor or a nurse, a practitioner, or a, 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 a physician's assistant, who has been specially trained in the unique needs of people in recovery. That's an expert. But I know the material relatively well. I've been looking at it for the last 20 years. Uh, and this is one of the slides that I like to show simply because we have a lot of patients at our program who don't have addiction. They, they came for their depression. They came for their trauma. Uh, they're a little insulted. They have to sit through uh, a lecture on addiction. But for the previous reason of the previous slides, I think this is a lecture that every American uh, should, or at least material that every American should be uh, uh, exposed to. But to have depression, to have a generalized anxiety disorder, is to be at much greater risk of addiction than the general population. Opioids work differently in people who are with depression. And I think it's important to know that. Sometimes knowing that makes sure that the progression never occurs. But there's a bi-directionality causally between these two. The same thing is true for trauma. A lot of what I can say about trauma, I can say about addiction. The two of them travel very close together for reasons uh, that I will explain. This is the way that I came to addiction. We did not think that you could create addiction if you were treating legitimate pain with prescribed opioids. And that turns out to be wrong. There are certain patients who are at unique risk. They have this very powerful, hyper-euphoric uh, experience when you prescribe opioids to them. How much of that is actually euphoria? How much of it is the lifting of depression? It's hard to parse out. Um, but this is a, I came to addiction fairly late uh, in my life. But this is, um, this is one of the exposures that we did not think was toxic. And when I hear about strategies, certain, certainly I love harm reduction. I'm a big fan of harm reduction. <laughs> But you should understand that you can do things in Canada that you cannot do in the United States, right? I'm starting to think, you know, when I think of Canadians, I'm starting to think that they are actually a higher evolved form of human life. Yeah. <laughs> they can apologize. They, uh, yeah. The Constitution says peace, order, and good government, where ours says life, yeah. liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. And they have universal health care. And so you can do things there from a, from, a harm, from a harm reduction perspective that you will never be able to do in, say, Texas, right? It's just not going to happen. Um, so when they talk about safe supply, you know, it's one, one thing about needle exchange programs, safe syringe uh, uh, programs, like absolute good research there, or safe injection sites, at great research. But safe supply, where you're actually giving out fentanyl, that's a bridge too far. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that that's a legitimate practice of public health. Um, but that's just one person's opinion. I think that the American uh, Association of Public Health should convene a consensus panel and really try and figure out where that is. But you could do that in Canada, and if anything goes wrong, you would have a health system that would be ready to catch that person. That is not the case in the United States. And so it might sound good, but it actually will put people who are already extremely vulnerable at far greater risk, right? Because I guarantee you, the drug war may be ending, 
thousands of people go to federal prison every week for nothing more than casual drug use that has been uh, convicted as a crime. You know, sometimes I think we we miss these things in 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 uh, in, in the United States because um, we use certain words, and I don't think those words really capture uh, what addiction is. The French have a much better word for addiction. They call it toxicomanie. And doesn't that sound beautiful? <laughs> we have toxicomanie, a lot of heroin, and we have heroin junkies. <laughs> I think that that word, that word matters because it gets to the point. It gets to the point. Uh, of all the frames that I've discovered to try to understand addiction over the last 25 years, the one that works the best for me, that makes the most sense, is environmental toxicology. Fentanyl is a toxin. The world has toxins in it. <laughs> There's a cone snail in Australia that if you're walking on the beach and you pick it up and it stings you, you will be dead before your face hits the sand. Fentanyl is a toxin. It's toxin for almost everybody, but there are certain people who it is especially toxic for. And so I really want to kind of hone in on this idea of exposure, right? When you are exposed to what you are exposed to what the pattern, what the dose, what the surroundings are when you're exposed to it, these things matter. And I might just add, there is a set of laws that govern environmental toxicology. It's illegal to put toxins in the environment, especially if they cross borders, right? And so I think that this is a very fruitful way of understanding exactly what it is that we're dealing with. And it just kind of removes a little of the sort of millennial Marxist bullshit that sometimes you will find in harm reduction. Because most people in harm reduction are doing good, humane work that saves lives, and that's critical. There is a section of harm reduction that just likes people to be hot and wants there to be no drug laws so people can get more hot. Uh, and I think that that's something that, uh, that we should pay attention to in public health. So the idea that, that we are exposed to different things and that those things depend on what's going on in the environment, do we or do we not have access to good health care uh, and how those exposures are interacting with our genes, uh, those things uh, matter. I would like to point out a book that just came out that was written by Arlene Geronimus. She is a public health researcher at the University of Michigan. And she has essentially developed over the last many years the weathering hypothesis. She's done this to explain the difference in longevity uh, in the different groups of people in the United States, specifically groups who are poor, people who uh, are groups of people of color. And what she says is that there is a sort of weathering that goes on depending on the stressors and uh, things that you are exposed to in the environment. And what's interesting, and this is one of the things uh, that I was shocked by in public health, is if you take a black family who are living in a low socioeconomic status neighborhood, and they do well and move to a high socioeconomic status neighborhood, their health metrics do not change. Their children's health metrics do not change. And Jerome says it's not that they weren't successful, it's the fact that they had to work at it and are continually pushing against uh, forces that, that don't want them to succeed. And so this is this weathering idea that it starts very early in life, in childhood, <coughs> continues and it's sort of a premature aging that shaves quite a bit of time off a person's lifespan. And again, I think this is a, an, a, an important understanding of how exposures actually work differently from person to person and how the risk is much different. Um, there's a very good writer I highly recommend him. His name is Dr. Carl Hart. He is the department chair for psychology at Columbia University. He's written some great books. They're provocative books. He asks some really important questions. And I think in his recent book, he opens by saying, I use heroin from time to time. It's a brilliant statement because it forces the argument that heroin is not that toxic for everyone, right? And that our beliefs about heroin you know, are often rooted in hysteria. I, I don't know that I would certainly go that far. In public health, we use a number called incident, or a measure called incident. Incidence is a, is a way of understanding how the disease is changing through a population over time. It is the number of people who got a disease in a unit of time over the population at risk. 
And so Dr. Carl Hurt, or my colleague, Bessel van der Kolk, uh, talking about psilocybin uh, and MDMA, and they say, well, you know, I've tried this and it wasn't so bad. This is what we call a denominator problem in public health. They are not in the denominator. You don't have to worry about the influence of heroin or psilocybin in a person who is absolutely at the top of their career at an Ivy League university. And you do have to worry about the person who is mopping your floors uh, after you go home. Right, and so this is, I think, you know, sobering because it really kind of drives home that you know some people are never going to get addiction no matter what they do, but other people uh, it doesn't take much. And so we'll talk a little bit about what the possible mechanisms are uh, about you know that weathering might be. Right. Um, recently, the idea that addiction is a brain disease has come under some. Uh, uh, um, it's always been under some criticism. There was an article, and I can send it to you, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times written by a new psychiatrist, Carl Eric Fisher. He's got a book out. It's good. I recommend it. I think you should buy it. Uh, I certainly do. I have several copies. Um, but he says that calling addiction a brain disease is misleading because it doesn't re look at social things in the environment, the mass incarceration, the lack of stable uh, health uh, care or uh, housing that might be subject to discrimination. Um, what I can say is that the pathophysiologic model of disease, which I will define, is the best way of understanding how those things actually cause damage in, in, the, in the body and in the brain. So I don't think it's misleading, uh, but I do think that we kind of have to understand the brain and then be ready uh, to move on. So when we look at uh, things like you know, genetic load, we have to understand that these genes operate in an environment of different stressors, right? So, to, so one of the things that's kind of you know sobering about genetics is that to say that Native Americans have a higher rate of alcoholism because of their genes is so inaccurate that it's almost wrong. I mean, the genes are different, but they are fairly neutral. Where you will locate the causation is in the environment within which they are operating. So the genetic explanation of addiction has some landmines and it's got some traps uh, that we have to be careful of, right? And I did these slides the last time I was here, but one of the mechanisms is what we call epigenetics. Now, you're probably very well aware of this, uh, so I'll go through this kind of quickly. But this entire field of epigenetics basically came from one study, right? It's called the Overkalix study. Overkalix is a tiny little county in the northern part of Sweden, right up by the Arctic Circle, right? And so this county has always lived on the edge of existence. I mean, sometimes the crops made it, and everyone got through the winter okay, sometimes the crops didn't, and the entire town was faced with the stressor, let's say, of near starvation, right? But Overkalix had exquisite records going back several hundred years. And when epidemiologists looked at these records, they, they noticed some interesting things. So what the, what the epidemiologists who looked at over Kalis's records noticed, and again, most people have heard this study, or the study of the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who had a higher uh, likelihood of PTSD, the Yehuda studies, I can send them to you. Um, but what they noticed when they looked at the records of young boys, and it had to be a particular window of development, 7 to 14 years of age, if they were exposed to that near starvation stressor, the rate of diabetes went down, but not in them, and not in their sons and their grandsons. A young woman was similarly exposed to food scarcity. Same window of development, the rate of diabetes went up, not in her, not in her daughter, but in her grandmother. <coughs> sex difference notwithstanding. What this study showed is that the stressors that are faced by one generation can have transgenerational influence on disease expression. Something is being inherited. It's not a genetic change. It's not a change to the DNA itself. It's an epigenetic change. These little methyl groups or acetyl groups that are attached to the DNA at a very, very specific point, like a locus of a particular chromosome. You can find Right? And toxins in the environment, exposures to toxins in the environment, create these changes that don't change the DNA itself, they change the packaging of the DNA, and whether the DNA will be easily turned into a protein or not. And that can make the difference between disease and no disease. And when I talk about this with our patients, this is kind of where I'm taking a little bit of a risk, 
because they look at this and say, okay, that's it. You know, every drink I had, every drug I used, created these packaging changes, I've still got them, and I'm gonna pass them on to my kids. Well, here's the good news. These epigenetic changes can go in the bad direction, but they can also go in the good direction. And so I encourage them to think that even in the time that they've been sitting through this boring lecture, <laughs> that they've been in treatment, they are erasing the epigenetic changes, which may go how far back in their family that are associated with alcoholism or addiction, and creating the epigenetic changes that are associated with recovery. Because there are two things that we have to account for, the heritability of the alcoholism and the heritability of the parent's recovery, which is an absolute real thing. So if I had a magic wand that I could give one thing to every family in the middle of this terrible, awful epidemic, it would be a family member that you're because that person, everything they've done, all the hard work they've put together, has a benefit that extends beyond them, but into their family, and maybe even into their community. So this is the idea behind public health, is to take a more ecologic view of how things like alcoholism, mental illness, choice operate in the real world. When we look at the brain disease model of addiction, that's good, but we're saddling the entire thing on the shoulders of the individual. It blinds to what else might be going on. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about this question, and again, I'm sorry about jumping around here. There are some excellent arguments out there for addiction being a disease, and this is really the article that started it. It was Dr. Leshner's article in the New York Times in 1997, and that was a big statement at the time. That addiction's a brain disease, right? But there have been a lot of people, and, and I think the, the debate, <laughs> I think I ruined my own joke. <laughs> the debate is kind of like the dress, right? There are certain people that I can talk to and say brain disease, and these people are like me, and they see that. This is what I see. There are other people that just look at the world in a different way. And when you say brain disease, they see something else. And what I've tried to do over the last 20 years is not really be such an advocate for this, but to make room for both groups. Because there are lots of people who just do not see themselves as having a brain disease. And then they get sober, and they do great. And we should celebrate their recovery too. So I will get into this debate if people want to, but I try very, very hard to kind of pick up who I'm, if I'm talking to someone, to pick up, you know, are they a golden white or are they a blue and black? And, and not to be too rigid about one or, or the other. Because I really do think that they, they see the world differently than I do. And just, again, because I'm an alcoholic, I can't always put myself in the minds of other people. I, you know, might get rigid about this when I realize that there are other ways to think about this. So, these are the common challenges that I hear against the idea that addictions of the brain disease. There's no evidence, there's never been any evidence that addictions of brain disease. I encourage you to go over uh, to the medical library of my medical school and look at the shelves and shelves of journal articles that have built up the understanding, the evidence uh, that addictions of brain disease. But there have been no advances in treatment based on brain research. That is simply factually wrong. Everything that we know about buprenorphine came from this research. Why buprenorphine uh, is a benefit. And I think it's, it's just a very emotional thing, and there are certain studies that people quote, and these are all really, really important points. The idea you know, that the Vietnam vets uh, who used heroin in Vietnam when they got back to the United States, they stopped doing that and that maybe drug use has nothing to do with the drugs, it's simply the environment. Again, I don't disagree with that. I grew up in Alameda, California. That's where most people came back from Vietnam. And I can tell you, in 1972, there were places in the island that you did not go to. Not there was heroin use going on, there was a lot of addiction, I assure you. So did the addiction just drift from one drug to another? It's hard to say, right? The rat park study, if you actually, the idea of the rat park study is if you put a rat in a skitter box, it's just a metal box with a lever, that rat will become addicted very, very quickly. If you put the rat into a nice cage with shavings and an exercise wheel and good food and other rats to play with, and when I say play, I don't mean checkers, <laughs> they don't become addicted to heroin. If you put the scare box rat into rat park, they stop using heroin. And the idea is that it's not really the drug that causes the addiction, right? It's entirely the environment. I don't disagree with this statement. I would say it a little differently. Housing matters. The quality of your housing, the stability of your housing, 
evicting a young woman, excuse me, a woman, single woman, single mother with children is an extremely toxic exposure. It programs her and her children forever. I would recommend <coughs> doing that, right? So it's not that housing doesn't matter, right? It's that the drugs can really be toxic. And even if you have free housing, there are some drugs that are so toxic that they will cause problems, right? If you actually read the rat drug study, what you will see is that by number, more rats died of morphine overdose uh, in the rat park than they did in the skinner box. So you have to really read the study uh, to see it. But again, these are all extremely good arguments. They make very important points. Those points should be addressed. Gene Hammond says that, and this is his book is probably the strongest as a researcher at, uh, at Harvard. And he says that most people with addiction, especially young people, they over time just stop doing it. They kind of change their friends, they grow up a little bit, uh, they get a different job, maybe they have kids who get married, and they just kind of stop doing it. And that's basically true. Uh, I won't say that that's not true. What he's doing is he's quoting a particular study, a very powerful study uh, done by the NIAAA called the National Epidemiologic Survey on Alcoholism and Related Conditions. And uh, NISARC is basically four waves of data now, time zero, it's tied to the census, so 10 years later, 10 years after that, 30 years after that. And what this study shows is that the people who said that they were using heroin or cannabis or cocaine at time zero, at time, uh, at, at 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 later, years later, fewer and fewer of them were doing it. And so this is where this desistance narrative comes from, that most people with drug problems don't go to treatment, they don't go to AA, over time they just kind of stop doing that, which will satisfy no parent of a 17-year-old using heroin, right? Uh, you have to be careful how you deploy this. I deployed it in my own household and got my head in. Right? And so, but, but this is a fact, and I can't, I can't, uh, uh, I, I don't want to uh, say that that's not true, and it really causes the whole, I mean, it causes most of what I was taught in treatment and in hey, hey, uh it calls it into question. Here's the thing. Uh, the questionnaire is computer-aided by an individual given to a very, very strong sample, very large sample of Americans. You know how they assessed who was using heroin at time zero, ten, two, uh, one, two, and three? They asked them. <laughs> See the problem there? <laughs> I don't know all the ways that my addiction continues to play itself out. I don't think the patient knows. I don't think anyone knows what's really going on with these people. Because to really find out if they're using drugs or not, you need toxicology. Now, toxicology, you know, I'm not saying that this doesn't say something. I think this is the way most people get over drug and alcohol problems. But I think it's a dialogue of privilege. These are people who have stable housing, good jobs, and enough money in the bank and health care. Right, uh, that uh, that yeah, they, they can they can mature out. I also think that sometimes uh, there's a bit of a um, competition between the models that we use to understand things. A model is basically derived from a theory. It is not the actual thing itself. It's a model. It's not really a plane, but it's a model. It's not really the thing you're measuring. It's a mathematical model. And so sometimes the model that we choose works really, really well, and very often it doesn't. And sometimes when you've got a model that's not really working all that well, and that's the argument here, right, that these, the, the brain disease model of addiction does not explain these things, sometimes what you can do is you can take your model and put it on the shelf and go to another model. And that model will be much better explaining what it is that you're looking at. Now, things might change. You might lose the ability to explain some things, but it doesn't mean that you're not looking at the same thing. It doesn't mean that both models don't have validity. It's kind of like observing anything in nature, like for instance a galaxy, that's something that you might want to observe. Depending on how you look at it, this picture, there we go, 
uh, you're going to see different things. It doesn't mean that the infrared camera is worse than the visible light camera telescope, rather. Uh, it just means that you're looking at a different aspect of that galaxy. And so these are all models that we could potentially use to try to understand a vision. You'd be surprised how well the moral model actually works, right? It doesn't actually get to the cost. The moral model for syphilis basically says this. Don't sleep with anyone but your virginal married partner, and syphilis will disappear from the human population in one generation. And that's basically true. It doesn't get to the actual cause of syphilis, but it doesn't work, right? And so there are all of these models. The life force model of addiction is what explains that desistance state. Yeah, here's a study that kind of goes a little further in further depth. This is a cohort of paramedics that this researcher at UCLA has been following now uh, even longer than the original researcher because the original researcher died. And these are heroin addicts that were followed over time. And what happened with these heroin addicts is that they started to fit into certain trajectories, right? Some people were using heroin pretty bad and they almost immediately got that. Some people just kind of chugged along where they were, right? Some people got much worse. Some people who were bad got better over time. Some people who were bad stayed bad. And that is a general pattern of trajectory that you can see for a whole bunch of different chronic diseases. And this is where I think the life course model is particularly strong. It understands periods of risk that change over the course of a lifetime. It understands the, it understands the danger of an exposure at a particular time when it might not quite be as dangerous before. What I'd like to do is kind of show you what the disease model of addiction. This is what I was trained in. Obviously, I'm going to be, you know, a victim of my uh, um, my training, right? And this is basically what the disease model says. It, it emerged from the work of these four doctors, uh, Louis, Rudy, uh, Bobby, and Katie. <laughs> they're kind of the, the fathers of the disease model. I'm sure there were sisters in there who were a mother in there. Um, but these these ideas not come together smoothly. This guy tried to have this guy thrown out of medicine for his life. <laughs> but because they were based on the scientific method, their, their assumptions stood the test of time. And this is basically what emerged, the pathophysiologic uh, 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 model of human illness. Now, this is what every doctor is trained in. I know it doesn't look like much, but that's everything we do in Western medicine. You go to a hospital, look at the tongue depressors, look at the MRI machine, it all revolves around this idea that you've got some kind of organ in the body, it gets some physical defect, and as a result, you see signs or uh, you, you observe signs or you, the patient describes uh, symptoms. That essentially doubled the human lifespan in only 100 years because it was just such a powerful Model. Now, it's, I'm, I'm cutting corners a little bit here because what we understand about disease causation today is that it's not as linear. It's much, much more complex. It's environmental. We have to take into account uh, those things. But you can see how it fits, basically, for something like uh, a broken leg. A lot of people say that a broken leg is more of an injury, not a disease, not to a pathologist. Pathologists are the doctors who actually understand disease. Five-year residency, as long as general surgery. Right? And so they believe all disease is injury. Some is on the gross level, where you can see it. Some is on the microscopic level or even on the molecular level. But this is basically how these conditions fit this model. And what the model says is don't go here, go here. Fix that, that goes away. And it happens to work pretty well. Uh, and it was around 1910 that this report came out of Columbia University that said, you know what, we need to get rid of all these different models, this uh, homeopathic model at Hahnemann University. We need to get rid of that, right? We need to get rid of, you know, uh, the, the, the um, humoral model and all that and buy into this new modern causal model of disease. We need to get rid of all the diploma mills and standardize uh, the medical school curriculum. Uh, and basically, doctors embraced this model, and, and the problem was is that it was great for some diseases and some areas of medicine, but it wasn't very good for things like neurology or psychiatry, because it was very hard to see what the, the organ was. No one really understood for addiction. The <laughs> defects, no one had a clue. And the symptoms don't look like symptoms at first hand. And so doctors basically around 1910 said, you know what, this isn't a disease. We don't handle symptoms. You should, see, you should read what doctors wrote about people with addiction in 19, excuse me, 1890 
compared to what they wrote in 1930. It's, it's astonishing. Right? And so this is shortly after that when doctors left the scene, the first federal laws were passed that uh, essentially criminalized uh, uh, addictive drugs. And so people with addiction were no longer patients. Doctors didn't defend them. If I could show you how addiction fits this model, then that would change. And now today we can. We know exactly how addiction fits this model. And that means that people with addiction are just as much patients as the person with cancer or the person with a broken leg. What that means is if you can't do certain things to a person with cancer, neither are you allowed to do them to the person with addiction. If you are required to do certain things for the person with diabetes, so too are you obligated to do them for addiction. So usually when people quote this, they're, they're kind of looking at the, at the ends. They're saying, well, when we call addiction a disease, things work better, people feel less bad, they come to treatment, we get paid, right? And in a sense, what I'm asking is not a teleologic question, not what it does if addiction's a disease. The question I'm asking is, is a disease of choice even possible? Is that something that can occur in the natural world? I can't see any scientific reason why not. I can think of religious reasons, I can think of political reasons, but not scientific reasons. Right? The capacity of choice, the capacity for volition is realized in the brain and a lot more, right? And something can go wrong. But what this means is more radical, I think, interpretation, which is these patients deserve defense that people should stand in the way of the criminal justice system that wants to incarcerate them and the illness of the patient. There are a couple podcasts, and I can send them to you. One is run by the Residents in Addiction Medicine at the VCU at Virginia Commonwealth University. The way these doctors speak about their patients is breath, the concern, the care, the understanding, the empathy. The defense of these patients is something that I had always hoped for. And that, to me, is the best evidence that the brain disease understanding of addiction has yielded benefits, right? Simply the fact that there are doctors who are going into addiction medicine, there are nurses and physician assistants who are doing addiction medicine not because they're in sobriety themselves, not because they have an uncle that they're trying to save, but because they think it's an interesting clinical problem. And they think it's cool to help people get sober. That is a different world that we did not have 20 years ago. But again, I would encourage you just to listen to one of those podcasts and to listen to the way those doctors speak about their patients. The problem with the disease model is it's not perfect. It's not the actual thing. It's a human-created model. So it's very, very good at acute disease. It's terrible at understanding chronic disease. And so what I would like to invite is that we kind of add all these things together and jump to a public health model of addiction. I had a, a little bit of a straw man there, but basically, yes, I think that this is a powerful model. We need better. We need to address the things that these are addressing. And that, to me, is an ecologic model that understands the entirety of the context of the disease. The, the public health model of recovery entirely subscribes, circumscribes the causal disease model of addiction. What that means is, is that this model rests upon this model, all right? And the reason I'm making this point is that it's become fashionable in the, you know, addiction's not a brain disease crowd to say that addiction's not a disease, but then advocate for a public health approach to addiction. And I'm calling bullshit on that. Right. You cannot do both. Because if you advocate for a public health model, a short course on the history of public health will show you that they all rest upon that causal path. It goes beyond that. It understands more like the what is the faith context of that person? What's, what's going on you know, over the life course, right? The public health model can do that, but it doesn't mean the disease model is wrong. It's just extremely myopic. It's vulgar in its reductionism. It's way too materialist. It can't understand the spiritual change, right? But it doesn't mean it's wrong. The advantage of the disease model is it may be bad, but it's never been wrong. And the other models all have examples of it. So what I would like to do is push back against those arguments by saying that there are two areas uh, that kind of 
you know, undermine those other arguments against addiction being a disease. One is epigenetics, which we talked about. The other is the idea that the brain is more than just the brain, that the brain moves out of neurons and into the immune system and into other areas of the body and then out of the body into the environment. This is called psychoneuroimmunology, the idea uh, that, that the immune system is the stress receptor for the brain. And if we want to understand what's going on in the brain, we have to understand what's going on in the body. So I would like to, I might not get up to all of these patients, but I would like to tell you about four patients that I met that really taught me major features of addiction and they've never left me, they've never left me. The first patient, I'm gonna use uh, stock footage here uh, to kind of just set up the blocking. It didn't quite look like that. <laughs> the first patient that I met was really the first patient I ever met, which is a patient that I met in the first few minutes of my third year of medical school on my surgery clinic. It was an elderly gentleman with pancreatitis brought on by his dream. And as we walked into the room, and of course I'm a medical student, so I'm way at the back, I remember something from pathology class that pancreatitis was one of the most painful things that a person could have and still live. That little fragment just popped into my head. And I can still remember the chief of surgery of my medical school yelling at this old man saying, listen, that pain in your belly is you done. And if you keep on drinking, you will have And we're getting tired of fixing you up. We almost didn't save you this time. So we're all here, the entire team, tell us right now, are you going to quit drinking or are you going to die? And I just remember this old man, his eyes were fluorescent yellow. His hands were flapped as he tried to pull the cheek. The surgeons were all standing around his bed like palm bearers, right? And he said, But what if I could? Uh, the poignancy of that moment two human beings trying to reach each other, right? The minute the patient sets any rejections, I've never, never left. And that's the patient who taught me this symptom that we all know which is persistent use despite negative consequences. If you look at the DSM, it is one of the major symptoms, right? These are the 11 of the current diagnostic structure for substance use disorder. If you take away the two that aren't really uh, definitional of addiction, right? You're left with these and they cluster, right? And this is essentially where persistent use despite negative consequences fits in. Something has gone wrong in the brain's ability to properly calculate value. The brain has a value calculator. It is broken in addiction, right? And so what, what people with addiction do is they overvalue future intoxication relative to all the bad things that have happened in the past. It's almost like a blindness. It's almost like a, a hemianopsia. They cannot actually see the thing that's right in front of them. But the thing that I think is important, I'd like to point this out to you, is every time the brain calculates value, it calculates something else. It calculates light. There is a probability component to that value calculation. And so as a person with addiction myself, what I have a tendency to do because of dopamine defects, which we'll get into, is I overvalue future drug-related rewards. And I overestimate the likelihood that they will work out as I intend. And I undervalue the consequences that might result, and I underestimate the probability that those consequences will in fact come true. I get the map. And that's what undermines this critical element of my decision making. This is the symptom that gets all the attention. This is the symptom that everyone around the person with addiction cares about. The family, the judge, the Navy, the California Medical Board, trust me. <laughs> this is the symptom that matters to the most of the person who actually has a the craving, the suffering, that intense, ruminative, extremely aversive, unwanted thought process about the drug. The person's trying to think about other things, bring drags them back to the drug, right? I've spent the last 20 years of my life trying to explain craving to people who have never experienced it. And quite frankly, it's the prosecutors that are the best uh, um, audience for me. 
murder talks. And this happened just in Louisiana a few weeks ago. The prosecutor said, this is not a disease. People with alcoholism aren't powerless. They can stop anytime they want. Put a bottle in front of them. Go ahead. They reach for it and put a gun to their head. And you say, how about now, Mr. Alcoholic? And most alcoholics with a gun to the head will be able to not drink. But they can't choose not to crave. And that's the more important measure of addiction. At some point, you don't have to have the behavior. You don't have to have the drinking to have that suffering. Right? So that, I think, is very, very important. The problem, it may not even be whether the drug is pleasurable or not. It's the fact that alcohol promises something. It holds something out, something very ill-defined, something always in the next drink. But this person, that old man, lives in a different world of probability than that surgery. Right? Alcohol opens a Marvel universe of fantasies and superpowers and things that cannot actually occur in the real world, but they suggest. And I think, actually, that's what people hold on to. Not the effect of the drug, not whether it's pleasurable or not. It's the fact that if you're traumatized, if you're not part of society, if anything bad is going on in your life, it's just the way life is, this offers you a way out. Mm. That is hard to fight. In fact, I don't think you can fight it. I think all you can do is sort of change the, the, the risk field within which you're operating. So what actually causes this? All right, well, this is the part of the lecture that I'm sure you've seen before. When I have a pleasurable experience, right, this area of my brain sends pathways up to several areas, but this appears to be the critical pathway, and the cells there release the chemical dopamine there, right? Dopamine is the first in a cascade of chemicals. Yum is all of this. But I can take yum and deconstruct it back to dopamine, which grabs my attention, zeroes me in and tells me this is important for survival pay attention to her. Normal pleasures release normal amounts of dopamine. Intoxicants blow this out of the water. They release very large and importantly, very fast spikes of dopamine. That curve, the slope value of that curve going up is the brain's value calculator. Value and likelihood. Right? So that is what, when the person who's smoking crack cocaine or crystal meth, every time they get that spike, the value of the drug, the likelihood that it will do something gets greater and greater and greater on the level of survival until the drug is survival. And nothing's higher than survival. And so anything that you try to bring, like a gun to the head, or the loss of your children, it's not going to win. The person really gets the message semi-conscious, but they really do believe the best way to get the kids back and straighten everything out with the probation officer is to secure survival now, the drug, and then we'll worry about that other stuff. And that's crazy, right? But that's the first thing that pushes us over to addiction. Alcohol isn't alcohol anymore. Alcohol is life itself. Right? And so you've seen probably this list before. These are all the chemicals that do that. Up or down, just doesn't see the map, right? These are all the behaviors that do that. And so this dopamine hypothesis is really the central dogma of addiction neuroscience. It's what tells us that really a person will have drugs, but probably a secondary and maybe even a behavioral error over here. Some people will never go over here. They play out their entire addictive lives here, right? But it's basically the same uh, defect in the brain, right? It's weird that you so this is my little periodic table of the intoxicants that I made up to kind of drive this point. Uh, these are all the intoxicants that you're like, and if, by the way, if there's a square up here that's yours and I haven't put it up there, let me know. <laughs> Changing this thing up is the CBD is not an intoxicant. Some of the things up here that are intoxication might actually be good treatments for addiction. Like you said, already know that ketamine seems to work for people with treatment resistant depression. Perhaps psilocybin. Bill Wilson dropped LSD, right? Who knows? There's lots to learn. I'm agnostic about what these things can do. What I know as a person with addiction is that this is my danger list of chemicals and behaviors. Still struggling. 
with my behavior around children. I, I can send this to you if you like. I can send you a nice high definition PDF of it. Uh, we have it laminated. It's a great place map for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so before we end here, I, I want to uh, um, just tell you about this study that came out during the pandemic. This study showed, and, and by the way, I'm joking around here because of the questions that you gave me. I'm trying to make sure I answer all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I don't get any, make sure you ask me either uh, afterwards or about uh, me. Um, this study showed that dopamine is also released with trauma. It's released with grief, right? And the belief now about dopamine is that it does not have balance. It's not good, it's not bad, right? In other words, at this early level of brain processing, before the signal is delivered to the amygdala, where it gets that first coding of emotion, right? The brain can't tell the difference between intoxication and trauma. They're the same signal, right? And so it's not until they get to the amygdala that the brain says, oh, this is really good. Or, oh my god, this is really terrible, right? So all of those things release dopamine. All dopamine does just tells me this is important for survival. So I made a list of all the things that we now understand dopamine to do. I call these the ends of dopamine, right? And so, yes, things are enjoyable, rewarding. Those things release dopamine. Things that are highly motivated release dopamine. But also things that are noxious, like trauma. Things that are nearby in time or space, about to happen, right? Expected, release dopamine. This is why the person who is an end stage cocaine addict will often tell you that when they use cocaine, they're not getting high anymore. They don't notice any euphoria. It's the getting it. <laughs> it's the getting the guy on the phone. It's getting across town. I've got the eight ball in my pocket. I'm driving home. I'm already high. There isn't a single molecule of cocaine in my bloodstream. My brain is priming the pump, releasing its own dopamine in anticipation. Uh, this person is a friend. I highly recommend her new book. Her name is Dr. Anna Lemke. She's the head of the Addictions and Dual Diagnosis Clinic at Stanford University. Uh, she wrote a book called Dopamine Nation. Very, very, very fine book. It would be the first book I would point someone to currently. But she was the one who made the point that things that are enumerated and ranked also release dopamine, which may be why social media can figure in. So I think this is a more modern understanding of what dopamine does. And to say that dopamine is pleasure is so inaccurate, it's almost wrong. It is the core component of pleasure and a whole bunch more. Right? So when we want to understand you know, what goes on with relapse, and I'm going to put relapse here in, in brackets, because sometimes you don't see relapse. Sometimes people come to AA or treatment and they don't have a relapse. So relapse doesn't have to happen. It's common, but it doesn't have to happen, right? And so if we look at the American Society of Addiction Medicine definition, which I can send to you, it's a very, very fine document, right? You can understand this one, right? Anything that releases dopamine could cause relapse. Things that went along with the use of the drug, things peripheral to the drug, the people that I was with, the sights and smells of that moment, even the angle of the sun in the sky when I use drugs. Those things release the chemical that dopamine partners with, which is called glutamate. That can cause relapse, right? And so glutamate is the chemical that comes next. It's the memory chemical. Big spike of dopamine, big spike of glutamate. That spike of glutamate is not normal. It doesn't just remember the drug, it burns the drug into memory. And everything that went along with the drug is part of that memory. And this is the enduring vulnerability to relapse that can persist for years, right? As time goes on, these memories become weaker. They don't necessarily drive the person's behavior. But in the first period of recovery, these things are extremely potent and they're not entirely conscious. We have a lot of patients at the Meadows who do great, they, they graduate, everyone's proud of them. They're absolutely fired up about recovery. They drink on the plane ride. Mm -hmm. Not because they don't want it, not because they can't get it. It's because they just didn't understand that there were going to be some cues waiting for them in the plane, that place they always used to have a drink. I tell her that uh, both my the vice president of addiction affairs and I run a workshop for people getting ready to leave, and we say, plan out your first 72 hours. You're going to go to a meeting? What? With whom? How are you getting there? How are you getting back? Plan out every hour if you have to, because that's such a high risk time. 
But if you get through it, then you've got foot in recovery. Now you're home, now you're cooking with gas. Right. A lot of patients, they just don't understand that. Right. So glutamate is that memory chemical. There's so much of it that it spills out and it starts binding to cells that it wouldn't ordinarily do that for. And that's what creates these pathologically strong memories, okay? And the cues that they contain. The third thing that causes relapse is exposure to stress, right? So it turns out that dopamine and the main stress hormone, or one of the main stress hormones, they're counter-opposed. They kind of keep each other in check, right? And so if I you know, release a lot of dopamine, like I get drunk, my brain will push back with the stress, right? So in a sense, I have a reward system and an anti-reward system, or if you like, a stress system and an anti-stress system. And so this is why repeated intoxication got to be. So one big release of dopamine from a drinking binge causes a response to restore homeostasis, which quickly comes back into balance. But if I'm drinking every day, or if I've been serially exposed to severe or chronic stressors that may rise to the level of trauma, the system can get stuck, right? That's the bi-directionality of reward and stress. And if it gets stuck, then it never really shuts off. The CRF is constantly recruiting the stress system, and that's what can cause end organ damage, right? So that's the connection, we believe, between chronic stress and chronic disease. All right. So that slide that I showed you earlier, all of these things operate through a common process. And that process is inflammation. And I'm talking about the very same inflammation that kills our fellow citizens with COVID. Inflammation in their lungs and their blood vessels, which is extreme, because it's not the viral load that kills them, right? It's the over-response from their hypersensitized immune system that does that. But that inflammation that they're going through, that intense inflammation happening in their lungs over a period of days, is the same inflammation that happens in a person with major depression or trauma or addiction in their brain over a period of years. So there are quite a few drugs that we know decrease inflammation for certain diseases that have now been shown to have some benefit in preventing a relapse now. It's that mechanical, right? And this is this area called psychoneuroimmunology, right? And, and even more science fiction, the connection between the brain and the immune system and the blood gut matters. And so it could be that there's a certain microbiome in my gut that's associated with recovery or associated with relapse, or at least correlated with relapse. I know this kind of sounds kind of science fiction, but that's where things are uh, right now. So were there any other I didn't get to the other three patients. They're fascinating, let me tell you. Um, but let me just say this. This is the first thing that that patient taught. That addiction is in brain, but you can't understand addiction in all you do is look at the body. That old man was admitted for pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is an inflammatory disorder. Or something else? He had something called pseudomembranous colitis, which is an over-infection of Clostridium difficile that sometimes happens when you get, bring people in the hospital and give them antibiotics. Brain microbiome, right? And so I think this is something that we should look more at if we really, really want to understand the patient. I think if we do that, and I won't take too much more time here, but this this idea that to understand the brain is There is a model that is that's right at the front edge of cognitive science that says that you know cognition is not just in the brain, it's in the body. And it takes place in a particular moment in time, historical moment. And that it's extended out from the body into the environment. The things that are in the environment are a big part of how I think and how I make choices. And also, it is the back and forth between me and the environment, me acting and the environment acting back, that we have to take into account, too, if we truly want to understand what we call the mind. And so, to me, choice, volition, to truly be understood, has to look at all of these things. Not just the brain, not just the individual, but where are we 
in our nation's history. Understand that if we start to use psilocybin therapeutically and it works, addiction changes. <laughs> addiction literally changes because that person has different choices, right? We understand that drugs are powerful because they're tools. They have utility. They put me back into the world. I can use them. And if we also understand that every action I give to the world causes a reaction, right? So if I use drugs, the world's going to react back. Quite frankly, I think most of the harm that comes from addiction is, yes, from the person using drugs and causing problems, but it's often how we respond to that that causes a great deal of harm as well. Right? This is what's called 4E cognition. I barely understand it myself. But if you take this and, and understand addiction in a 4E cognition way, it solves a lot of the problems that people have been bringing up about how the environment plays a part here, how choice actually works. And I think that this is a, a more uh, leading way of understanding the future of how we conceptualize and how we treat addiction. Um, but I'll just stop with this. These are, I wanted to end on a positive note. <laughs> I uh, have a slide up here that, that makes a very, very important point. When you incarcerate a person, when you strip them naked and you shower them in front of strangers and you put them into an army jumper, it's a toxin. It's an environmental toxic exposure. And it programs them health-wise for the rest of their life and their family, their community, and often their children. Right. So I think that we overuse and talk uh, incarceration in ways that really create long-term damage, maybe on the epigenetic level, maybe on other levels. Right. And for every uh, one year spent in prison, two years are shaved off that person's lifetime. And that I think is something that we really need to understand. This study just came out, and I find it very, very interesting. It shows that for those states that expanded Medicaid, there were fewer drug-related arrests, right? So by getting more people basic health care, basic coverage, you can actually decrease the impact of mass incarceration. There are two theories at work. One is, is that it actually, by broadening coverage, you can increase arrests. And there is some evidence for that. When more cities try to create loopholes to create uh, needle exchange programs, arrests went up because local law enforcement pushed back. <laughs> they didn't like the idea. So unless you also change the law that makes paraphernalia illegal, your little you know idea might actually increase harm of the people that you're trying to help. And I think this is the one that, that really is, is what's happening. When people have coverage, they're less likely to have criminal justice involved. And if they have a crisis, they're more likely to receive treatment or be with people who can help them, right? With that coverage, it kind of lifts all groups. There's even a financial stability that's gained when people get uh, uh, expansion of their health care. So there are 11 states that have not expanded Medicaid. That's the problem. That is what's driving mass incarceration. I, I gave a lecture for the main uh, addiction therapist and professional conference in Denver earlier, and it's the first time I've ever done the incarceration and health lecture. And people, well, I've given it before, and people hated it. <laughs> I don't know how good it is. I'll have to see the reviews when I get it. But I quoted, you know, this idea that. There has essentially been an initial insult to volition in our nation's history. And I'm lifting right out of Michelle Alexander's book here. The first one was slavery. The second one was Jim Crow. The third is this period of mass incarceration, which may or may not be ending. I think that if we're not careful, we don't start creating some changes, there will be a fourth. And what will that fourth insult the volition be hmm. the people who have health care acting so that other groups of Americans don't get that is an environmental toxin and exposure to that I think is not what Americans are so it's time now it's time to start doing what other countries have done if we really want to stop addiction if we really want to correct mass incarceration it's time to start sharing the things that most of us in this room already have. 
So I'll I'll stop there and be ready for your abuse. <laughs> <laughs>